Good to see you, Raj, Tanya. Um, and looks like we have uh, a lot of attendees. Uh, wish we could see you too, but uh, I guess the, the virtual is gonna have to do. Uh, I'm Josh Page. I'm a professor of sociology uh, at the University of Minnesota and affiliated with the law school. I um, be <clears throat> became interested, well, I've been interested in bail and pretrial for a while. I um, spent a year and a half conducting ethnographic research working as a bail bond agent to um, study the commercial bail industry. And through that became knowledgeable, not only of the industry, but of pretrial, pretrial justice. Since then, um, I was a co-organizer of the Bail Reform Summit we had in uh, Minneapolis last year. Tanya was involved, as were I'm sure others who are attending. Um, so that's it. I, I research, teach, do some advocacy around bail, and that's who I am. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Tanya, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. So hi, all. I'm Tanya Hunsey. I am the uh, founder of We Rise Leadership Collective. It's a collective of formerly incarcerated and justice involved women and non-binary folks uh, creating systems and policy change in a transformative and restorative healing justice lens. I also sit on the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission and am one of the founding members of the um, Ramsey County Bail Reform Working Group. Uh, when I look at bail, it really at its core, it's about family separation. It's about destroying communities. It's extraction of wealth from the communities um, that least have it. Even if you are able to pay a bail, you're, it's taking away from your, your, the money that you need for essentials. So I know for myself, I've been in a position of um, either paying bail or having that money to pay bills. And of course I'm going to get myself out because otherwise I'm going to have to worry about losing my place of employment, my place of living, my children, all of those things that, and that's not just me, that's every person that is, um, is dealing with a bail system. We're one of two countries in the world that uses a cash bail system. Ironically, it's uh, the Philippines is the only other country that uses a cash bail system. And when we look at it, we see how many people out of the 600 people, 600,000 people in jails across the country, 70% of them are pre-trial. And that, so that means that they have not been charged officially been um, convicted of a crime. And you know, what is that really doing to our country? It's the criminalization of being poor. Uh, most people that are unable to pay pale are the um, fall within the third uh, poorest people in this society where their medium income is about $15,000 before they go, go to jail. And we're expecting them to use their resources to pay to, to get out. Um, so really looking at how can we reimagine what, what our communities can look like without money bail? How can we put those resources back into the community to building stronger communities where we can be able to care for our own people? Thank you, Tanya. Dr. Raj, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to say. I'm, I'm, I'm a late entry, so I'm just going to skip it real short, saying that I'm a faculty member at Metropolitan State University uh, in the School of Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice. I'm also an activist involved in, in NAACP Minneapolis chapter, right, uh, with IWOC and, and many other organizations that we are all working towards what Michelle Alexander, right, Robin Steinberg and others say, you're right, that we ending the addiction to mass incarceration, right? How do we address that? And bail is one way of adding to the mass incarceration. So I'm gonna stop at that and I, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Josh. I'm here to learn a lot. So let's kick it off. All right, excellent. Um, just a quick reminder for everyone, I'd put a, a message in the chat. My understanding is that we're still expected to end at approximately 10 a.m. And so I'm going to try and get things running here pretty quickly within the next half an hour. As I mentioned again, if you have any questions, please submit them to the chat, either directly to the panelists or to the, all the panelists and the attendees. All right, now the first prompt. 
Um, and Tony, you kind of gave us a nice segue into this. You talked a little bit about the effects of the cash bail system being that we see family separation, that it's effectively wealth theft, that it's a, it leads to the destruction of communities. Oftentimes when we talk about building new systems, we can, we can either talk about what it means to build that system, or we can talk about the things that we're trying to build away from. Um, maybe you can lead us off in this particular question, but when you imagine a new system of pretrial, whether it involves bail or not, um, what are some of the evils that you are desperate to avoid as you build and envision a new system? I think that one of the things that we have to be, you know, the new, the new wave is um, risk assessments, right? And that's a new wave of another way to say, okay, well, we're going to put this person into a system and we're going to calculate a number that says if they should be in held in, um, in jail or, or released and whether they're worthy or not. I think that one of the things that, you know, and I know, especially when we're looking at in Ramsey County, uh, in our working group to, to reduce bail, um, one of the things that we've had to really be pushing at is how can we use someone's criminal history score when we know that the, the communities of color and poor people are policed more Right. So when we look at even Philando Castile and we see that it was he was stopped over 60, 60 times. Right. He had and it was well, that's because he's black and he's in lives in a black neighborhood. Right. If you go into a rich neighborhood, they're not going to be stopped as much. So they're not going to have the same criminal history score. So that's one of the things that I'm really um, I personally am trying to push against is how do we look at this person at this moment in time? Because if you looked at, you know, and I've said this in the working group, if you looked at my criminal history score, I would never get out. Like I would be stuck in jail for, you know, jaywalking, but that's not who I am right now. So how do we look at, if we're going to use um, risk assessments, how are we going to be able to, we, and when I say we, I mean the community that is directly impacted by the bail system. How are we able to look at that and say, you know, we want to look at this person right here and right now. Are they a risk and to to the community? And really, that's the other thing is like looking at the falling back on what is public safety, right? So it's um, it's eye opening to realize that in the court's eyes, public safety means whether they're going to return to court or not. Are they likely to return to court or not? That's not public a public safety risk in my eyes. That's a, how do we help support them to get back to court? How are we doing those things? That's so I think that those are some of the evils that we have to, and I wouldn't say evils, but just being aware, looking at other um, systems and other places that are seeing, you know, you'd mentioned um, New Jersey. And when you talk to people that have done that work in the, in the community in New Jersey, what are the, what are they coming against now? and seeing, God, I wish we would have done something different in this front end, um, a lot of other places. So if, you know, when we're working on how do we change this, it's really looking at what has worked, what is working in other places and what's not anymore. Thank you, Tanya. And uh, there was a question from Daniela that I think picks up on something that you said, Tanya. You, you talked about risk assessments and you talked about criminal history scores and that the court effectively is determining who is worthy of bail, who is worthy of release. And we see that reflected in the question from Daniela with respect to what's the alternative to risk assessments. And so I take that prompt and go to Raj or Josh. I don't know who wants to step in here first. Um, maybe Raj. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the question of what should we be using? What should the court system be using to determine an individual worth of release? Or is that even the right question? No, I, I'm not sure if it is a right or wrong question. I mean, it's it is a critical um, thing, a critical question, right? And so it's necessary for us to ask those type of questions about the integrity and the veracity of algorithms that we often employ, right? Algorithms has worked in sales and in commercial sectors, and now it is involved and engaged in, in our criminal justice system. We swear uh, DOC and others have invested a ton of money in algorithms, right? Uh, what we are realizing that algorithms um, may be perfect in, in calculations, but it hasn't addressed the, the caste system that exists in our 
criminal justice system, right? The racial disparities hasn't been uh, completely undone just because we employed a scientific methodology. So I, towards that end, I would say, let's get back to the, the idea of how our indigenous communities often, often address the issues that cause that when people cause harm in our community, how do we undo that, right? Um, we have many other examples of this, uh, right? Uh, Steinberg, I think uh, uh, Robin Steinberg often, uh, you know, in their project, uh, in the Bronx, right? Uh, Freedom Fund project often say, let's use disruptors, right? So if somebody comes into the bail system and if we bail them out with this Freedom Fund, right? Let's make sure we fill in the gaps of what is missing in their lives that ultimately brought them to the criminal justice system, right? It is not about the criminality. It is about the opportunities that is lacking. It is the gaps that exist in their lives, right? How do we fill those gaps so that we can now present an entire a human being with dignity, with, with, uh, with, uh, with honor, with values, right? He or she or they will come back to that system to face those charges because they are ready now, right? So I would say yeah, Daniela's question, right? Uh, you know, if we are, if this is the only option that probation and parole and judges have, then it's time for us to think about how do we engage the community, right? It, it cannot be just a prosecutor, it cannot just be a, a, a um, the public defense uh, defender, but it also needs to involve the community to come in and say, let's talk to this individual, right? Collectively, we come together, we form a circle around this person and then address and help and ele elevate this individual. So once that, their, that personhood and their uh, integrity and their humanity is restored, my God, transformation is hap will happen easily. So um, less reliance on algorithms, right? Let's do uh, less high touch work. Uh, I mean, high tech work and more high touch work. I'll pass it on to Professor Page. And, and Josh, before you jump in on that question, uh, and Raj, I just kind of want to summarize what I'm hearing you say, because what I'm hearing you say is that, and we'll touch on these two things a little bit later on, is that there's an equity issue, and Tanya mentioned this as well, because mm -hmm. the folks coming into the system are disproportionately Black, they're com from communities of color. Yes, and that the bail system or the court system really is effectively divorcing this question of bail from the ultimate goal, which is to repair a harm. Yes. And, and, and that we, the system itself, the design of it is flawed because it's not addressing what the end goal is when we're putting this question of who's worthy of being released first. Yeah. Right. And, and Andrew, just, just to add, I mean, uh, Tanya earlier referenced uh, New Jersey and uh, Mark Levine addressed uh, uh, New Jersey. We also know that despite the the, the no ending cash um, bail reforms had been passed since 2014, they still haven't addressed the racial disparities that still continues, right? That historical harm, that 400 years of history and 500 years of genocide, right? We still haven't addressed those things. Yeah. Thank you, Raj. And, and Josh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you real quick. You know, we've talked a little bit about you know, the structure of the system that leads to harms, right? And that effectively the question that then gets asked at the front end is, are you worthy of being released? How do we envision a system that doesn't ask that question? Mm -hmm. and, and Carrie and Sarah, I see the questions that you have in the, in the, in the, the chat, we'll get to those. I wanna give Josh here a chance to touch base on this first topic. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, first of all, I think, you know, um, one of the most critical things is moving from a system, it, it actually starts with the police and it's about giving people summonses rather than taking them to jail in the very first place. I mean, one of the most radical things that New Jersey did, it has actually nothing to do with their bail system is they made it, they, they, uh, the attorney general issued a memorandum that said, police give people summonses, tell them, give them a court date, tell them they're not supposed to commit a crime while they do that. People then show up for court, they don't ever go to jail in the first place. So we don't have to worry about whether to use an algorithm or not because they're not detained. Um, so that's the first part, right? Uh, the second part is that we return to an individualized analysis of 
cases. And we have the presumption of release. And so everybody is presumed to be fit for release. And if a prosecutor deems that there is an identifiable reason for that the person is a flight risk or risk to public safety, they need to file a motion with the court. And that motion needs to be dealt with in 48, for 24, 48 hours. And there needs to be an adversarial hearing where the prosecutor needs to make the case while the defendant has defense counsel that is in the decision then the judge needs to decide you know, make the determination that that person should either be you know detained or released on conditions or conditionally released and the defendant has the ability to appeal that case and so only with those so there needs to be a summonses presumption of release and deep procedural safeguards that put the burden on the court to establish that the person is you know, needs that there needs to be something done in this case. It needs to be hard to detain someone or to put them on conditions. And those conditions need to be the least restrictive possible to achieve the goals of maintaining the person, making sure the person comes to court and they don't hurt themselves or others. Thank you, Josh. Um, for Karen, for Sarah, the questions that you had in the chat, um, those are pretty broad questions. In fact, effectively, those are the reasons we're here today. So my hope is that the panelists will touch on aspects of the answers to those questions as we continue our conversation. Um, so I'm not trying to ignore you. They're just questions that are so broad that I'm hoping that you'll get the answers as we continue this conversation, all right? Now, um, I wanna start with Josh, this, with this second prompt, and this is obviously a riff off something, something that both Raj and Tanya have touched on already, which is that the system, the folks who are being introduced to the system um, don't all come from the same place, right? Um, we, we're trying to envision and develop a system of pretrial supervision or pretrial detention or, or pretrial whatever that is equitable, that engenders systemic equity. But how do you do that? And you know, Josh, you, talk, you touched on this just now in terms of maybe it's just that cops shouldn't be sending folks to be arrested and detained. But how do you ensure systemic equity in a pretrial system when there's little to no equity in the individuals being brought into the system in the first place. Uh, Josh, can you take this, can you start us off on that discussion? Sure, yeah, thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I think first of all, we shouldn't rely on criminal justice system to produce equity. Um, you know, and you're right, when inequality in, inequality out. But um, again, I think first things, make sure most people aren't coming to, aren't coming to, aren't coming to jail in the first place. Um, I think you have, um, you know, I, I really appreciate what Raj said about the, the um, community disruptors that the bail project is doing, um, debug at Silicon Valley and their participatory defense system has a very similar system. And so what they do is that one of the big inequities of the current system, whether it uses money or not money, is quote unquote community connections, right? Is, um, and I should point out one of the biggest re one of the main reasons that people are unable to get out of bail in a system that uses commercial bail is not simply the inability to pay. It is the inability to come up with a co-signer, somebody that actually has a good paying job that's willing to take responsibility and co-sign the bond with the bail company and um, give away all kinds of privacy rights and often pay a bunch of money. So that is a huge thing. So one of the main equities is so-called community corrections. What the community disruptors do and what um, participatory defense does is they, one, they bring the community in and empower the community, right? The community is already involved in the bail system, but it's mostly now to extract money from them and to make them de facto um, uh, monitors of bail companies and the courts, right? It's to bring them in and say, what are the community supports? How can we, you know, what are the community supports? And then to work with the public defender to help get the people out. And then if people do not have those community supports, they, they as Raj said, they locate community resources to connect them into the community. And they start by the assumption that people want to deal with their case. They are not, you know, by definition, flight risks or so forth. And so it is um, a real form of community empowerment and community connection, I think is critical to some of these things I see as very promising, the you know, community, uh, the bail disruptors, participatory defense, um, and I'll leave it with that. Thank you, Josh. 
Uh, Tanya, I'm going to turn to you as a follow-up to what Josh mentioned, but I do want to touch base with our attendees real quick. It was brought to my attention. I thought you guys could see the questions that were being asked. It turns out you can't, uh, and that's fine. Um, I should let you know that Carrie asked a question, for example, about how do we get rid of the cash bill system? Uh, Sarah followed up with a similar question. Um, could you share how you see bail reform being successful in Minnesota in the face of the prison industrial complex? Those were the questions I talked about being a little bit too general for a specific response, but hopefully we will get those responses as during the course of the conversation. All right. Now, Tanya, um, Josh has talked a little bit about community disruptors, about participatory defense, and really about building a community connection between the criminal legal system and the individuals who were being brought into it, um, such that there wasn't a need for bail. There wasn't a need to ask question of release. Can you talk a little bit about the, the calculus or what goes into building that community connection between the criminal legal system and community members and to the extent that you see successful examples of that in Minnesota? Yeah, I think that one of the things that has to start is, um, I think there's like this notion that when we're talking about courts and we're talking about the system and they bring community in, they say, oh, we're gonna give you a seat at the table. Well, that's, we need more than just a seat at the table. It needs to be our table. They need to, we need to be able to be seen as leaders in experts in what can be done. I can give an example. We were um, in Ramsey County. One of the initiatives that they have is a, a text reminders for court, right? Which is a great thing. And I'm not, I'm not downing that at all, but we were in a meeting and it was being talked about for about two hours. And I finally said, you know, let's, let's really talk about this. Let's talk about this because I know myself as a single mom, when I knew I had to go back to court, if I miss court and I would say this is the majority of the people, people are not missing court because they want to be outlaws and saying, you know, forget the system and, you know, putting their finger up to the system and we're just not going to court. That's not what's happening at all. A lot of, I knew when I had court, I also knew that I had two babies. I didn't have a vehicle. I had to call into work. When I'm already um, don't have the funds to take a day off of work, really, um, and it's that's what it is. It's taking an entire day off of work, right? Like you don't go. I have a court at 9 a.m. Well, you're usually not seen until it could be two o'clock in the afternoon before you're seen. So you really have to take off this entire day. You have to, you know, figure out childcare. You have to miss work. You have to miss pay. You have to call in with that anxiety that like. I'm going to get fired because I'm calling in and missing work. The other thing is like the thought of walking into court, into that courthouse. I can say this for myself. I still get a feeling in the pit of my stomach that, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to leave here. Right. So we, in when you're talking about someone who has everything on the line, they can't miss a beat. So then you want them to go into court. So how do we start to build real alternatives? You know, Zoom court. We were told a year ago when we brought this up, that could never happen. That will not work. And guess what? It works and it's happening now. And we just need to be able to have community support around people and giving them opportunities to have, we do a Zoom court where they're not spending the entire day. They're actually getting a time. You know, if it's 9.08 and they have to be on their Zoom meeting at 9.08, those are how we start to build in community. When you bring community that has actually gone through this or going through this and you say, what are the solutions? What can we be doing different to be able to support you to get to court? If, and of course, like Josh said, doing summons and, and, you know, and releasing people and saying, just go, you know, like, here it is. We're not going to bring you down to the, we're not going to bring you down to the jail at all. We're not booking you. We're not doing any of that. Why are we wasting resources on that? at all to begin with, right? Um, and it's really about, the other thing that really needs to be said is what happens is we come up with these solutions that saves the court money and saves the system money, but it's never put back into the community, right? It's never brought and said, okay, like how can we redistribute the, these funds and these resources back into the community that we have been siphoning from this community for however many years, right? It's um, how do we put it back in the hands of the community to say, you want to, we want to, we want to, you know, take care of our people. If this person is having an issue and, you know, I know Raj is 100% on this, like restorative justice, 
we're not even talking about that piece yet, right? Because they aren't officially convicted of this, um, you know, harm. But can we start to build around that already, right? Can we start? I know that, you know, restorative justice at its core is you have to have you have to have relationship with community to begin with for you to care if you've harmed them. So if we start to put those back into the into the community where we're saying, hey, get let's build community first, then we can reimagine community and we don't have to reimagine the bail system because there will be no need for the bail system. The need will be dropped dramatically. I won't say that there won't be a need at all, but when we start to say, you know what, we're gonna support these people, let's do this. You know, and I I do want to um, say because I know that Damon put this in the in the chat that inequality is doing participatory defense in the community right now. So there's a lot of things that are happening really well. You'd ask this. Um, I I'm the last person to to like whoop whoop any any system, but I can say from my own experience, we've seen dramatic um, push forward and dramatic progress in Ramsey County. And I can say this just by when COVID has struck within a week of the shutdown, Ramsey County had reached out to myself and to other people and said, what can we do? How can we come together to get the numbers down? And they have dramatically gotten the population of not just the jail, but the workhouse by over 50%. And so we're seeing that it works already. We're seeing that, you know what, we don't need to have these people, our people, our community, behind bars for them to, for the communities to be safe. So I think that looking and continuing to build on, on what community, the solutions that we have, instead of systems coming up with their own solutions and then bringing us in at the tail end and saying, well, what about this? Gotcha, Tanya, thank you very much. So just to recap for everyone real quick, Josh introduced the idea that in order to move past the bill system, we needed to work with community. Tanya talked about what it looks like to have those connections work in Ramsey County. However, when we talk about building community, there are always kind of systemic opponents, right? Uh, Rob um, sent a message to us asking about the for-profit prison model. Folks who profit from people being in cages, um, bail bonds, individuals, that type of thing. Raj, I wanna turn the question to you. When we think about those who would oppose real change in the system of cash bail, um, who are those opponents? And how do folks who are proponents of change, like Josh, Tanya, other individuals like yourself, how do you answer the um, questions from folks who would oppose this kind of change? You're muted, Raj. <laughs> I need a whole hour for that. Um, uh, I know, and we've got seven minutes, so. <laughs> I know. So, I mean, one is that inviting people to, to come in and sit down and have these conversations, right? That that is lacking. When you see 45% of the people voted for 45, there's a statement that they are sending, right? And there's so much fear that, that exists here, right? In the absence of law enforcement, in the absence of the judicial process, a, um, we will have all of these people running over in our communities and taking over our communities. That's all of these fear that the, and the dog whistles and the bullhorns have been blown in this past year or so that has that has kept our divide right much stronger and much more solid and we have to we, we introduce what I you know what most uh, constitutional uh, analysts will say you know our constitution is based on uh, negative laws how do we introduce a lot of positive laws positive laws, i.e. equals to saying the government or, or branches like judicial system guarantees the health and wellness of our communities, right? We guarantee that our communities will have access to resources if they are trapped in the system, right? It is, it is this absence of these positive laws within our system that continues to con uh, uh, increase the divide. And so for me, inviting these communities and say, you know what, let go of our, our colors, blues and the reds, right? Let us talk about humanity. Let us talk about what is your value? What do you really value? And what is my value? And how do we see intersections in those values? 
And then how do we introduce positive laws in our constitution, Minnesota state laws, and then reduce the footprint of the legal system and the laws, uh, you know, um, um, law enforcement. So de-policing and de, uh, de uh, you know, reducing the, uh, the footprints of the county attorney's office, footprints of the judicial system will help, I think, for the most part to restore that hope in our, in our state. And, and Raj, before I, before I come back to you with the next question, I did want to note that we got a comment, not a question, um, from, let me see here, from Damon, that inequality just yeah. started a participatory defense chapter here in the Twin Cities. I don't actually have the, the details for that, so if someone does have the details, send that to me and I will happily share that. Um, by my watch, we've got five minutes left. I don't know if they're going to kick us out at 10. I don't know how this is going to work. Um, so in lieu of asking, oh, well, let me put it this way. I'm going to ask my next question to all of our panelists so that they can give concludes, conclusory remarks for everyone. And the question is pretty simple and has been touched on, I think, at this point already. But can a more equitable pretrial system also be restorative? Or does an equitable pretrial system have to be restorative? Um, I'll start with Raj. Raj, these are your, your closing remarks. I will go Raj then Tanya, then Josh, all right? You know, and Andrew, Andrew, if we can, really quickly, I'm, apologies, <laughs> Dr. Raj, for jumping in there. We are aiming to wrap um, in five minutes, so if we can keep the closing comments uh, brief. And then for attendees, I will post the links to the next uh, panel breakout in the chat, so please click on which one you'd like to attend. And for those of you who are interested in CLE credit, if you scroll up, there are links to documents for you to be able to access that credit. Okay, apologies. No problem, thank you. Rash, you got a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I'll, I'll say this, I mean, you know, Andrew, you, you are a part of LRC and LRC has done a great job intervening in suspensions and expulsions in school, right? And really reducing that number. What, what they are doing is to bring all these communities, bringing the school, bringing the families, and bringing any, anyone who has been harmed, anyone who caused the harm together to have this conversation and introducing and inviting an indigenous process. And I think, I think therein lies the, the solutions that we've been waiting for, right? But it has always been in our back doors. We just want a progressive system that continues to look forward as opposed to using the Sankofa principle to look back and say, this is what our indigenous communities invoked, used, and they've been successful. How do we re reintroduce, right? Rather than reimagine. Because we never imagine just a system. We just imagine a punitive system, right? So to help with reimagining the justice system, right? Let's, let's imagine what love looks like in our streets and in our court systems and in our institutions. With that, I'll just pass it on to, is it the, Professor Let's go Tanya. Yeah, thank you, Raj. Oh, Let's go, Tanya. All right, I'll make this quick. I think, you know, and I keep going back to this. If we're going to talk about any sort of, you know, justice, injustice system, as I like to say, we have to really, we as a community, if we can focus on how do we reimagine community, right? Like I get a lot of people that'll ask me, how do we, you know, I want to help with ending mass incarceration. What can I do? And I'll look at them. I'll say, do you know your neighbor's name? Because that's how you start. That's really how we start is we have to build connection with community. We, you know, like that's how I have to know my neighbor's names. I have to be able to walk over and say, are you okay? Do you want to come over for dinner? Do you, you know, do you need a ride to anywhere? Do you want me to watch your children for a little while? That's how we end mass incarceration at its core. We start to build true connection in community in relationships. And it's the same thing for the bail system. Once we can start to build true connection in community, you know, it's very easy um, as an abolitionist to say, I want to tear down the bail system. I want to tear down the bail system. But there's this other side to abolition that's, you know, that is at my heart in the core is build something new. Let's build community. Let's build connection. Let's build real life where, um, you know, I, I say this a lot that because of my background and because of where I came from and always feeling like I did not have a community, 
And I thought, oh, once I get to this place, then I'll have community. Once I get to this place, then I'll have community. And I really realized within you know the last five years that there, this society does not have community, no matter what status you have. There's not community. There's not true community. And that's what we need to focus. That's what I need to focus on, I should say, because I can't do tearing down, tearing down, tearing down without having that life giving, let's build something new. Let's build, how do we start to support each other in a true and real way? All right, Josh, you wanna be really quick cause we're at 10. No, I'm gonna pass. I'm gonna let you, why don't you have the last word, Andrew? All right, so my last word will be to share some comments. Um, I, I got the information I was looking back from Damon. Um, the participatory defense chapter in the Twin Cities is called, is being called Resolved. And you can contact them at 651-505 3288 or via email at we at gmail.com. I also got a question very quickly about do you have any suggestions for next steps? Uh, thank you, Julie, for that question. Um, I don't know that we're going to be able to go into it right now because I think we're done. But in your materials should be the contact information for everyone on this panel, for Raj, myself, Tanya, Josh. Um, reach out to us. You know, we're not we're not generally very shy people for the most part. So email us, give us a call. Um, this is a long conversation. Right? And it's, it's going to be a long um, time in getting the bail system reformed and reimagined and rebuilt such that it can be equitable, such that it can be restorative, such that we can focus on repairing harm as opposed to asking whether an individual is worthy of release, which I think we can all agree is the wrong question to be asking at that point in any proceedings. Um, hopefully you guys have enjoyed the conversation. We apologize again for the late start. We tried to be as quick and as thorough as possible. Um, it is 10.01 a.m., so I know we're past our time, and Seda's probably going to jump in and shout at me real quick here. Um, please do contact us if you have any questions. And on behalf of Raj, Tanya, and Josh, and myself, okay. thank you for listening, and thank you for being here. Love you all. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Thank uh, you all. We'll see you in the next panel session.